Barry. I'm one of the orthopedic sports surgeons here at the, the Core Institute. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you today about rotator cuff injuries, uh, talking about what they are and how we can treat them uh, with both non-surgical and surgical options. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest or any relationships with any commercial companies to disclose. So uh, first we'll talk about what the role of the rotator cuff is. Um, first of all, it's, it's a group of four muscles. There's one muscle in the front, uh, there's two muscles in the back, and there's one muscle on the top. Um, the the first function of the rotator cuff is kind of self-explanatory. It, it rotates your humerus. Uh, the humerus is the arm bone. So the subscapularis, which is the muscle in the front that you can see on that left-sided picture, uh, in the front that you can use to internally rotate your humerus, which basically means bringing your arm into towards your body. The two muscles in the back are important for external rotation, which means kind of the opposite of internal rotation, so bringing your arm away from your body. Um, so that's the, the first function of the rotator cuff. The second function, which is uh, more important, is something called force coupling, uh, which is an uh, effort to stabilize the, the ball of the arm bone within the socket of, this, of the shoulder blade. Uh, force coupling, the idea behind it is you're combining multiple forces together to get the desired action. The biggest muscle around your shoulder is called the deltoid, which is the muscle on the outside of the shoulder here. Uh, that's the most important muscle for lifting your arm in order to raise it above your head. But you'll notice in the picture on the right, the pull of the deltoid muscle is directly uh, up. So if you only had the deltoid muscle, instead of raising your arm up, it would more be lifting it towards your side. So this is where the rotator cuff comes in. Uh, by pulling on the head of the arm bone, it pulls it into the socket of the shoulder blade and then enables the deltoid to do the action of actually rotating rather than just lifting the, the ball. So in this x-ray, it's an example of someone who's had a massive rotator cuff tear and so they've lost that force coupling. Uh, the x-ray shows that the arm bone is raised up out of the socket so that it's not uh, concentric or it's not perfectly aligned with the socket. So when somebody has a rotator cuff tear, uh, we kind of want to know how are we going to treat it. Um, so some of the goals of treatment would be improving pain, improving your strength, and preventing the progression to a form of arthritis. Uh, the most successful aspect of the treatment is improving the pain, and that's kind of what uh, everything is geared toward when it, when it comes to treating these things. But you also will improve strength. It will also help to prevent arthritis. So as far as treatment options go, uh, there's things such as NSAID pain medications. These are the simple over-the-counter drugs such as ibuprofen, uh, which, is, uh, which is Advil, or naproxen, which is Aleve, or a prescription strength medication called Celebrex, which has a little less side effects than the other two. Uh, another option would be physical therapy. Uh, then following, following that would be steroid injections, and then finally operative repair. So in terms of NSAID medications, the benefits to these is that it can actually provide pretty good pain relief. Um, these medications are non-addictive and they're non-drowsy, so it's a nice place to start. Uh, the downsides is it can cause stomach uh, and intestinal ulcers. It can damage your kidneys and they can also uh, worsen or even lead to high blood pressure. So even though they're over-the-counter medications, they do have side effects like pretty much any other medications. <coughs> uh, next thing we'll talk about is physical therapy. Um, when you have a rotator cuff tear, this, these two pictures are showing the shoulder from the side. And there's the rotator cuff muscle on the top that that blue arrow is pointing to. There's two in the back which are on the left side of both pictures and there's one in the front which is on the right side of both pictures. Uh, the left picture is showing a normal rotator cuff, the right picture is showing a tear. So the goal of physical therapy is to take the muscles uh, that are attached to tendons that are not torn and strengthen those muscles. So they target those specific muscles and that enables you to kind of overcome that tear and improve your symptoms and your function. At physical therapy they'll do a variety of exercises that are all geared towards strengthening these muscles around the shoulder and this can um, help alleviate what you're feeling. So 
people ask if the symptoms go away, does that mean that the treatment is a success? Well, yes and no. It, yes, it's a, it's a success because our whole goal is to make your shoulder feel better. But physical therapy doesn't cause the tear to heal. Um, it just strengthens everything else around. So for many, this pain relief and this improved function can be long lasting, uh, but it didn't actually heal the tear that's there. But as long as the symptoms aren't there, it's kind of all that matters is, is getting, you feel be getting, getting you to feel better. Um, so one thing to think about though is that with physical therapy, you, you don't heal the tear. Um, in this study that looked at uh, rotator cuff tears and following them over time to see what happens to them, they found that in about half of the shoulders, they did have uh, enlargement or, or widening of the tear over the course of two or three years. The tears that were full thickness, which means you're torn all the way through the tendon, uh, about 60% of those enlarged compared to partial thickness, which means that it tore just kind of half of the way through, um, there's about 40% enlargement. So the bigger the, the tear is, kind of the more likely it is to, um, to get bigger over time. Um, another thing that this study found was looking at progressive degenerative changes in the muscle. So over time, uh, the muscle itself can get replaced with fat and become non-functional. So when they looked at the patients that had tears that got bigger, 30% um, of those went on to this um, atrophy, meaning shrinking of the muscle and replacement with fat. The patients who had tears that did not get any bigger, only 4% of them had the fatty atrophy, uh, meaning that uh, they did not progress. Now when we talk about the fatty atrophy, th these are um, images of an MRI, uh, and it goes from left to right, uh, steady worsening. So on the left, this is kind of what that muscle should look like. The muscle is circled in white on that image, and the muscle is, shows up as dark on these MRIs compared to fat, which is light on the MRIs. So as the, this progression uh, continues, you can see that the muscle is steadily being replaced by fat. What's important with understanding this is that as we get towards the third picture, and especially towards the fourth picture, this process is irreversible, meaning that the muscle is not going to come back. And if the muscle doesn't come back, then uh, there's not really a, a fix for that because even if you do go and hook the tendon up to the bone again, uh, the, it's attached to a uh, muscle that doesn't work, so it, the tendon itself doesn't necessarily work. Uh, another treatment option would be a steroid injection. Um, this is uh, what we think about when somebody says they got a cortisone shot. Uh, what the steroid is, it's a really strong anti-inflammatory, so it kind of works the way that the NSAIDs work that we talked about before, uh, but this delivers the medication directly to the source of the problem. Um, you could inject it into two spots, either above the rotator cuff, like in this picture, or you can inject it below the rotator cuff, like in this picture where the arrow is. Uh, decisions on where to inject it kind of depends on which side of the rotator cuff the tear is on, if there's anything else that we're trying to treat, like if there's anything inside the actual shoulder joint that we're trying to treat at the same time. Um, but uh, both ways tend to show pretty good relief. So the benefit is it can calm down all the in inflammation that you have around the, the torn rotator cuff, and that can help with the pain. Um, so pain relief is good, but it could also make it so that you're able to perform the therapy exercises better because now your shoulder doesn't hurt as you're trying to lift your arm. Uh, but once again, this doesn't heal the tear, it just compensates for the tear that's there. Something to consider is if you're doing a steroid injection and you think about having surgery after that, it's very important to wait a certain amount of time between when you had your steroid injection and when you would have a surgery. Um, this graph is looking at something called odds ratios, which means uh, how likely you are to have some outcome compared to a different group. So this is comparing people who had steroid injections to people who did not have steroid injections. And the higher that the bar is, uh, the, the worse it is, because it means that you're, you're uh, more likely to have it compared to people who didn't get the injection. Um, and you see that the bars kind of come down to one, which one means that you're just as likely as if you didn't have a, an injection at all. Um, but in the first two months, the, the, the failure rate of the surgery, meaning that the tear uh, recurred, is much higher. So it's important to wait, really we usually wait at least two months, but preferably even three months 
between steroid injection and surgery. Uh, another potential option is uh, PRP injection. So what is PRP? It, it means platelet-rich plasma. We make this by drawing your own blood and you spin it down in something called a centrifuge and that separates it into layers. Uh, then we selectively take the layer on the top in these pictures, which is that kind of like clearish yellow layer, um, and that layer has some, some proteins in it that might have healing and anti-inflammatory properties. So the obvious question is, does it work? Um, the, the research on this is kind of mixed as far as effectiveness. Some studies have shown pretty good results with it. Other studies have shown no difference than this and uh, a steroid shot. It's likely not going to heal the tear, just like all these other treatments that we've been talking about. Uh, the more likely benefit from this is that it works as kind of a natural anti-inflammatory. So it's injecting your own blood products into an area that's inflamed and that probably calms down that inflammation. Um, downside, because the research isn't as great on it, the insurance doesn't cover the cost and it can be pretty expensive. So that would be one consideration. Uh, but it's probably not harmful, so it probably doesn't have a huge side effect profile any more than a steroid shot would. Um, so if you're willing to spend the money and you really want to avoid surgery, it, it doesn't necessarily have a downside. So next we'll talk about surgery. Uh, typically, these rotator cuff tears are fixed arthroscopically, which means uh, through small poke holes around the shoulder. And we use a camera and some specialized instruments to fix the tear. Uh, the pros to surgery, there's good evidence to support favorable results. Uh, we're able to actually fix the problem rather than just strengthen the compensatory muscles, meaning those, those other muscles that are not torn that can uh, potentially make up for the torn tendon. Um, and as surgeries go, it's a relatively low risk surgery. The cons to it, uh, it can be painful because it's, it is a surgery and the rehab process um, can, can take some time before your shoulder's feeling uh, back to normal. Uh, you spend about four to six weeks in a sling. Then after that, you do about six weeks of range of motion work where we're really just trying to get the stiffness out of your shoulder and get your shoulder moving normal again. Uh, following that, you do three months of strengthening where we're trying to get the muscle strong again. Um, overall, it's about a six to 12 month recovery process. Now, most patients feel about 90% of the way there around four months or so, um, but it can take up to a year until you're as good as you're gonna be following the surgery. And it is a surgery that is low risk, but it's not a no risk surgery, meaning that there, there can always be things that happen. So that's why a lot of people choose to try the non-operative interventions first. So some of the, the benefits of surgery, this is another graph that's looking at uh, some specialized scores that we use uh, in following patients after they have some sort of intervention. Um, as we move from left to right on the graft, it's looking at uh, further time out from surgery or, or no surgery. The black bars are the groups that did not have surgery and the lighter bars are the groups that did have surgery. And we see that over time, both groups do get better so that the bar gets higher, which is good on these graphs. Uh, but the patients that had surgery um, have a, a bigger improvement than the patients who don't have surgery. So that's kind of why we're willing to put people through the risk of surgery because the results at the end are better. Now this is another graph that looks at some similar uh, outcome scores on these same groups of patients. Um, the three lines on the top uh, are all scores where being higher is better and you can see that the surgical repair group is higher in each of, in each of those uh, score functions. The one on the bottom is just uh, pain scores essentially. So the pain score is higher if you're in more pain, lower if you're in less pain. And um, with the surgical group at the final follow-up, uh, they're in less pain than the non-surgical group. So now I'll kind of take you through a typical patient with uh, a rotator cuff tear. Uh, so this patient's a 55-year-old woman. She's had a one-year history of pain in her right shoulder, right along the outside of the shoulder, which is where um, these, these uh, tears tend to hurt. Um, it's particularly painful with overhead activity, which is pretty common when you have a rotator cuff tear. It's hard to bring your arm overhead and especially to lift anything overhead. Um, it's waking her up at sleep or from sleep about five or six times a night, which again, this is kind of when it hurts the most uh, when you have a rotator cuff tear. 
Um, and she doesn't remember ever having any kind of specific injury or lifting something where she felt a pop, anything like that. When we do a physical exam on patients, this is some of the tests that we do to, to test how strong the rotator cuff is. So the picture on the far left is called an empty can test where the patient puts their, <coughs> their arms up in this position. And this is um, isolating the rotator cuff muscle on the top called the supraspinatus. The one in the middle, um, we are externally rotating uh, the arms against resistance, and this is testing uh, one of the muscles in the back, and then the picture on the far right when somebody's actively pulling their hands against their stomach, and then the examiner tries to pull their hands away from their stomach, and that's testing uh, the subscapularis, or the muscle in the front of the, of the shoulder. Uh, this next couple slides, I'll just take you through some videos of an MRI. Don't expect you to, to understand exactly what you're looking at, but this is typically what you would see um, when you get an MRI to assess the rotator cuff. Um, this first uh, video is showing uh, a slice of images that start from the front of the shoulder and then they make slices as you go back to the back of the shoulder. This is working through and you'll see the ball of the humerus on the left side and the cup on the right side. There's the uh, rotator cuff all around. I'll, I'll show you some selected images uh, in the next couple slides. <coughs> now this is looking uh, with the patient laying down and it's taking slices down the, the shoulder like this. And the front is towards the top of the image, the back is towards the back of the or the bottom of the image. You see a tendon in the front, a tendon in the back. <coughs> And the last view that we'll go through is uh, taking slices starting from the inside of the shoulder and working towards the outside of the shoulder. <coughs> and you follow the rotator cuff on the top and along the left side and the right side, it's gonna turn into a black tendon. And at the very end, rather than black, you see an open hole towards the right side. So these are slowed down pictures of this. Uh, the two pictures on the left and in the middle are showing a tear in the, the supraspinatus, which is the rotator cuff muscle on the top of the shoulder. Um, rather than being a nice black line that goes all the way to the far left side of that black bone there, um, there's a, a patch of white. And that white is fluid, and there's fluid there because there's not tendon there, because it's torn. Uh, the picture on the right is some of those images that are with you laying down. So the ball uh, of the arm bone looks kind of like a golf ball on a golf tee, which the golf tee is the shoulder blade. Um, and in the uh, top or the right side of the image, you see the black line coming in the, in the very front of those bones. And there's another bright spot right before it gets to the end of it, and that's another potential tear. These ones are from the images where it's coming from the side. Um, you should see, so that black circle in the middle of the image is the very end of the arm bone. And um, there's a pretty large uh, white patch toward the right side of the top of the black circle. Um, <coughs> this is showing that tear that was on the top. So, this patient has a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus, the tendon on the top of the rotator cuff, and also a possible tear of the top of the subscapularis, the subscapularis again being the muscle in the front. So we went through some options with this patient as far as what we can do. Uh, we can do physical therapy, we can do a cortisone injection, or um, we can go through operative repair. This patient elected to try physical therapy first, um, which is a very reasonable um, option for her. A lot of patients will get better with physical therapy alone. Um, so uh, we plan to see her again in four to six weeks to see how she's doing. She came back about five weeks later. Uh, she had some improvement, but still was, uh, had pain that was waking her up two to three times a night. She was a little frustrated with her progress, wanted to um, get her shoulder back to where it was before, so now she decided to opt for operative repair. So when we do surgery, we do it arthroscopically. So this is a um, picture of a patient that's um, under anesthesia. There's a 
the purple line that you see, we actually draw out on the patient's shoulder just to tell us exactly where the shoulder blade is, where the collarbone is, where you see it lab labeled clavicle. Um, and this gives us an idea of kind of where we are around the outside of the shoulder. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of portals that we use. The portals are the small poke holes that we can put instruments and the camera through. Um, the portal on the left side of the arm, where it's marked posterior portal, is in the back of the shoulder. The one just to the right of that is the lateral subacromial portal, meaning that its lateral is on the outside. And then there's an anterior portal that's marked that's in the front of the shoulder. And through those holes, we can kind of work and fix the, the rotator cuff um, without making a big open incision. So if we look at a normal shoulder, this is kind of what it should look like. Um, the picture on the left is looking from the back of, with the camera in the back of the shoulder, looking directly into the front of the shoulder. And um, <coughs> you can see the tissue is not very inflamed. It's kind of looking how it should look. Uh, the picture on the right is looking now above the, the arm bone or the humerus, and that uh, white tissue where that bubble is, um, that's the rotator cuff, and it's attached to the, the bone like it should be. Now with this patient, uh, it didn't look quite as pretty as the other imaging. Um, there's a lot of inflammation where you see all of this kind of frayed tissue, looks like kind of like a sea anemone. Um, that's all the body's response to what's going on inside the shoulder. Um, <clears throat> on the picture on the right, the left side of the picture is the cup or the glenoid that the ball is supposed to sit into. The right side where you can kind of just see a thin edge of uh, white on the far right and bottom side of the screen, that's the ball or the humerus. Uh, we're looking directly at the tendon of the uh, subscapularis, the tendon in the front of the shoulder, and it looks very frayed. It's also able to be pulled away from the, the arm bone where it's supposed to attach. Um, so this is, uh, correlates well with the MRI that we saw where they had the small tear there, and it's a big enough tear that it, it should be fixed. We fix it with some specialized instruments. Uh, this is one system that's on the market uh, where with that tool on the left picture, you punch a hole in the bone, then the um, inserter in the middle of the picture, you, you screw in this plastic anchor. And the plastic anchor looks like what you see on the right side, where there's, it looks kind of like a drywall anchor almost. Um, and then it has uh, sutures that come out the end of it. Uh, those, those sutures are, have two strands that are each the, the connected to the same full strand so that it slides within the anchor itself. Another system that's on the market um, doesn't use a uh, plastic anchor, it uses just all suture. Uh, so these, uh, when, before they're delivered, it looks like the picture on the left where it's uh, just kind of like a straight line. Once it gets into the bone, it expands and becomes kind of bunched up like you see on the middle picture. So the right side shows a schematic of what it looks like. So the, in that far right picture, there's two pictures within the picture. Uh, the, that image on the right is how we insert it, so it's straight, and then you pull out the metal inserter and then it balls up, which you can see just to the right of that. So now it's strong and it's not able to be pulled out of the bone. So in this one we use the plastic anchor. Uh, the, the hole in the bone was already punched and now we're screwing in that plastic anchor. Um, the plastic anchor is going to have the sutures that come out of it and then we need to find a way to pass that through the, the tendon that's just to the left of the plastic anchor. <coughs> uh, one way to do that is these specialized tools called bird beaks, which they kind of look like a bird's beak, so that's where they got their name, um, where you can poke through the tendon and then there's a jaw that opens up to grab the sutures and pull them out through the other side so that um, you're able to tie it down. So on the left, we've already passed that uh, two of those strands through the, through the tendon. And the image on the right, um, you can see towards the middle and the far right side of the image, um, the, the sutures were tied together into a knot. And now, instead of floating away from the bone, that tendon just to the left of the knot um, is now firmly attached. So it's able to heal there. Uh, when we went to just above the arm bone, again, the, the Humerus is that kind of circular object on the bottom of the image. Um, rather than looking like a normal shoulder, which we see on the right side, there's a large hole there and it's not attached to the bone. <coughs> uh, 
So we like to mark that spot so that we can find it later when we go to the top of the rotator cuff. So we have this long needle that we can put in through the outside of the skin, and then we pass a, a uh, suture or a string through that needle to mark our spot. Um, in this patient, we looked at the rest of the shoulder and there was no other issue. So this is kind of looks mostly normal. Now we take the camera and we put it above the rotator cuff. Um, so you can see on that drawing on the left uh, where we have the, the scope looking. Um, and then what we see is on the right image. Now it doesn't look exactly this perfect when we first put the scope in. You have to kind of clean up a lot of uh, fatty tissue and inflammation. But uh, this is the view that we like to see after that's done. And you can see that our suture is going right into where that hole in the rotator cuff was. That's the, the suture is the purple string. Now we take the camera and take it out of the back portal and put it into the side portal so that we can look at that hole straight on rather than looking at it from the side. And again, we see our purple suture inside that hole. So inspect the tear in the rotator cuff. You can see a lot of frayed tissue. That frayed tissue can't heal because um, it's too damaged to heal. So we use this specialized device called a shaver, which you can see on the right picture. Um, <clears throat> to kind of clean up all of those frayed edges so that it gets to a healthy tendon. And this is kind of the final result of that. So now it looks a little prettier and it looks like tissue that actually has a chance to heal. So we use some uh, kind of graspers inside the shoulder to kind of manipulate the tendon and uh, figure out exactly how we want to put it down. And again, we use this plastic anchor that we can screw into the bone. Now, in order to get the tendons, or the, sorry, the sutures through the tendon, we have another specialized tool um, that you can put the suture in the bottom jaw of it. This, I'm talking about the picture on the left. Um, and then there is a, uh, an upper jaw that then you can grab onto the tendon with. Then there's a needle that comes out through the bottom jaw and goes through the top jaw where it looks kind of like a trap door on the top. And that delivers the suture through the tissue and then into the top so then we can grab it, grab the suture from the top and pull it out of the shoulder. Um, so you use this to pass all of those sutures through the tissue. And you can see that the, that's what we did on the right hand picture. Then we take all of those sutures and we tie them together and that uh, pushes the tendon down to the bone so that it's able to heal. But you do notice there's still kind of a flap of tissue on the, on the far end of it. So in order to get that flap down, we have another set of anchors that we put a little further down the bone. We stick those sutures through the, the holes that you see on the far, the picture on the far left, and then we deliver it into bone and lock it in place with the plastic anchor. So then this enables us to kind of, this is a, a picture of that anchor in place, and then now that closes down that flap so that it's watertight. And when we put the scope back in the shoulder, you can see that instead of having a hole there, now we have a, um, repaired tendon. So uh, see the patients usually um, at certain intervals. So about a week after surgery, uh, the patient's doing pretty well, not taking any opioid medications anymore. She's still using the sling and doesn't have any issues. Um, six weeks after the surgery, now the incisions are totally healed. Her motion's improving, um, but still pretty stiff, um, <coughs> which is to be expected. At this point, she can stop using the sling and we're starting therapy to improve the motion, but we're not doing any strengthening yet. Uh, 12 weeks later, um, patient doesn't have any pain really, um, almost back to full motion. She's gonna continue with her stretching and with her uh, strengthening with physical therapy. And then finally at six months, um, patient has no pain in the shoulder, just a little bit of weakness still, but it continues to improve and her motion's totally back to normal. And at this point, she doesn't have any restrictions and can return to, to activities as tolerated. And so at this point, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you might have. A thin cuff could mean a couple things. Um, it could just be saying that you have a partial rotator cuff tear that then is now thinner than a normal cuff. Or if you've had rotator cuff surgery before, um, <clears throat> sometimes the cuff itself can be a little bit thinner than just normal tissue. Um, the reason why you would have a shoulder replacement um, would be one if you went on to have arthritis in the shoulder. 
um, or if there was no way to repair the, the rotator cuff, a certain kind of rotator cuff or a certain kind of shoulder replacement can help that. Now if you do have a rotator cuff tear and you are going to get shoulder replacement, you need to have something called a reverse total shoulder replacement, which instead of having the ball on the arm part and the socket on the, on the shoulder blade part, it's reversed. So now the ball is on the shoulder blade and the socket is on the arm. Um, the reason why you do that is some uh, kind of mechanical reasons, so, but because of shifting the ball to the other side, it shifts where your arm rotates and it eliminates the need for the rotator cuff. So how we talked about before with the force coupling where it, your rotator cuff stabilizes your shoulder, by reversing that and using some kind of complicated physics, um, you no longer need the rotator cuff to stabilize it, so now your deltoid is able to just lift your shoulder. If you try and put in a, a traditional shoulder replacement or what's called an anatomic shoulder replacement, you run into those problems that we saw in that x-ray where the ball uh, rides up on the shoulder. And if it does that, then your, uh, the plastic piece that attaches to the shoulder blade can get loose and then you have a lot of issues and need to get a revision shoulder. So that's why you would need a reverse total shoulder if you have rotator cuff tearing. Before going through x-rays, so generally speaking, when I see a shoulder patient, um, I get x-rays. Sometimes x-rays are kind of referred to as like the stethoscope of an orthopedist because uh, the, what your bones look like, if you have any arthritis, if, how the alignment is of the bones, it's all very important information because it can dis distinguish between different kinds of shoulder problems. Um, so I would, I would get an x-ray when I'm first evaluating somebody with shoulder pain. Um, as far as an MRI, you don't always need it to know that something's going wrong with the rotator cuff. Um, those kind of physical exam uh, tests that I showed before, like with the patient putting their arms up and then you push down, um, that can give you an idea about where um, the injury is to the rotator cuff. So if you do that and it's just wildly weak and you can't hold your arm up, you have a pretty good sense that there's a big rotator cuff tear there. Um, but uh, so you don't necessarily need the MRI immediately to kind of start the treatment process. So just based on the physical exam, you can offer things like injections, you can offer things like physical therapy to see if their pain gets better because that's the thing that really matters. Um, and then if they don't progress with those treatment options, then you sometimes think about getting an MRI. Yeah, so the, the physical therapy exercises that we talked about, um, those can try and strengthen all the muscles around the shoulder uh, to get you back to a spot where you can uh, function. And, and certainly things like golfing are a reasonable thing, a reasonable goal to get back to. Um, so not everybody needs the surgery to get back to golfing, um, but kind of like we talked about before, some people end up needing it because uh, the non-operative treatments alone don't, uh, don't get them where they want to be. Yeah, cortisone injections or, or corticosteroid injections are uh, a good option because it can help with that inflammation, can help with the pain. Um, you don't want to get them too frequently. I usually only recommend around two or three in a year uh, because it can theoretically make the tear worse because of the fact of what what cortisone does. So it's an anti-inflammatory, so it cuts off the cells that come there to uh, cause inflammation. Some of those cells are good because they're healing cells, so if you do cortisone, it can shut down that healing process. Um, it hasn't really been sh necessarily shown in literature that a, a getting a steroid shot is then gonna lead to your rotator cuff getting worse, um, but that's more likely to happen if you get shot after shot after shot. Um, but um, Getting, getting an injection every four to six months um, really isn't necessarily a problem other than having to come in and get the injection. I mean, as many times as it can. Um, you, can you can certainly have another tear that happens after you repair it. You, you tore your original tendon. The new tendon that we give you isn't as good as your original tendon because the biology doesn't really work that way. Um, so you can always run into a situation where it tears again. Um, the, the more times that you have to like go in and get it surgically repaired, um, the less uh, likely it is for you to, to have a completely normal shoulder again. Um, but uh, 
it doesn't necessarily mean you can't go in and, and uh, repair it. Uh, not necessarily diet. Um, avoiding any kind of big injury can help you from tearing your rotator cuff. Things like uh, shoulder dislocations. If somebody's over 40, they're more likely to have a rotator cuff tear during that dislocation event. So certainly big traumas would be something to avoid. Um, it helps the shoulder to kind of keep it strong. So doing a, a gentle exercise program, even in people with normal shoulders, isn't necessarily a bad idea to keep all the muscles strong. Uh, but as far as preventing the tear, it's tough to say because most of these tears are just a degenerative process where for, from years and years of overuse, the, the tendon gets uh, injured more and more and more. So a certain group of people will have rotator cuff tears and a certain group of people won't. Uh, we don't necessarily have any good predictors on who's going to get it and who's not. Um, there's not a set limit. Um, you probably wouldn't perform surgery if your muscles went on to be replaced by fat, like, by fat, like we saw in that one slide, uh, because then it's just not really effective. Um, the type of tear that you have is um, important for deciding if you can fix it later. Um, that tendon over time can retract, so the tendon's on the ball of the humerus and then it tears away. And over time, it can retract and get further and further away. How far it retracts um, can be a, a marker for how likely it is that we're going to be able to take it and pull it back to where it's supposed to be. Uh, so yeah, I guess the answer is it all, it all depends on a lot of things. Um, but in certain kinds of tears, the earlier you fix it, you, the better. Like things like a big traumatic tear, where you lift something heavy and you feel a big pop and suddenly you can't lift your arm up. Um, these are kinds of things that we usually try and uh, fix sooner rather than later. Um, or if somebody, like I talked about, had a dislocation and we know that you tore your rotator cuff because of this event, um, when it's a complete tear, the earlier we can get to it, the better. Um, the more common kind of tear is that kind of degeneration over time that we talked about. And with that one, it's, it's less of a uh, urgent issue. It's, it's more depending on your symptoms and kind of what you want to what you want to decide as far as treatment goes. It can if it if it hurts. Um, <laughs> it depends on where your arm is. Usually the rotator cuff isn't going to necessarily hurt by keeping your shoulder by your side because it's not really activated. When you're lifting your shoulder up, that's when you start to need to use the, the rotator cuff. So if you're on your phone like this, it's not necessarily stressing the rotator cuff. Um, certainly not dangerous for it. Um, the activities that are more likely to hurt are things when you're lifting your arm overhead. It can still enlarge even with, with therapy. Um, the, the biggest issue is just kind of what your symptoms are. So doing the therapy probably won't necessarily stop a tear from enlarging that was going to enlarge, um, but it also will make your shoulder feel better. Yeah, so the typical spot for a rotator cuff to hurt is kind of right on the deltoid here. Sometimes it's in the front, um, but that pain can kind of radiate down the arm a little bit. Generally speaking, pain that goes past the elbow and into the hand especially doesn't usually come from the shoulder. That's usually something that's more coming from the neck. Um, but that's definitely a, a big distinction to try and decide if, if somebody's pain is coming from an issue that's going on in the shoulder or is it coming from the neck because uh, neck pain can cause, or neck issues can cause shoulder pain 